Amen. Amen. Let's give God a great big hand. It's wonderful. As you came in today, you were also given a piece of paper that has Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 on it. Um, I think I made enough to go around so that everybody can have one. If you don't have one, raise your hand so they can give it to you. And the reason why I give those out is I want you to uh, make notes in the back as we try to conclude the message that I started a few weeks ago. And I feel it's important to conclude it. Um, and the question, the way I want to conclude it is to ask the question, what kind of a judge are you? What kind of a judge are you? Um, So we've been looking at the question, what does the Bible mean that we are not to judge others? And uh, it's very clear, as you see it in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. These are the words of Jesus in the most important sermon that has ever been preached. I don't care how many good sermons you've heard. The best sermon that was ever preached was preached on a mountain. And this is part of the text of that message. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I mean, do do you get that point? I know, I know we've talked about it already, but I want to go over it so that I'm, it's clear that you did not forget what we talked about. If you judge people harshly, God will judge you harshly. You cannot judge others harshly and expect God to be easy on you. If you judge people hypocritically, okay? And what does that really mean? You have a big old log in your eye and you see a a speck or splinter that was a minute part of the log that is in your eye. You see it in somebody else. She gets excited when I start preaching. <laughs> you see that and then you, you want to say, let me take yours out. And we have already established that God is, when God says do not judge, he doesn't mean don't Use your brain to determine what is going on. That's not what he's saying. And we, I gave you several passages where God uh, actually, in this particular passage, he already told us, don't give what is holy to dogs, right? Which means you got to know what holy, what holy means. Then you got to know what dogs are. Right? You have to make some kind of judgment. But God doesn't want the wrong kind of judgment. And that is why for this uh, passage, he has said, don't be superficial about your judgment. You can be superficial, 
by just judging on what you see. Many times I have done that. You greeted somebody, they didn't say hello back. And by the time you got home, you already called seven people. And you don't even know what condition that person was in when you said hello. They may have been going through hell. So, don't be superficial about how you judge people. In fact, Jesus said it. If you look at John chapter 7, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 7 and verse 24. I think that's 24. What did Jesus say in there? Stop judging by mere appearances and make what? A right judgment. So God expects you to make a judgment. But he says, don't just do it by the way you see people. And James made reference to that in his book. And he says, you cannot just look at people as they come in and say, who dresses nice? Who looks like they're rich? Who looks like they're respectable? Many times you come to this church, you probably won't think I'm respectable. Amen? I'm not real. I don't care about what I wear. As long as it's decent. But there are some churches that if their pastor don't wear a three-piece suit, they fire him. So, it's important that you don't judge people by the way they look. You don't judge them by their accent. You don't judge them by the clothes they're wearing. You don't judge them by how much, how much uh, makeup they have on. That's why you cannot really be married to a person if you don't like them without makeup. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. In my, in my country and in my Yoruba culture, they say, Oropo nu we kobo. There are so many things hidden in a book that is sold for one penny. There are so much. You cannot judge the book by the cover. You can have a book that is well, the cover is well designed. The design was made up by Orrin Carpenter. And you know it's got to be a good design. But it's not about the design. What's in the book? So it's really important that we understand. That's why Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances. So when Jesus said, do not judge, he doesn't mean everything goes. Amen, light. I heard a few amens. It doesn't, it doesn't mean everything goes. If everything goes, you might as well throw away the Bible. There is a reason why we say we are the people of the book. Because it is the book that gives us the guidance and the, and the, 
uh, rules on what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. When you become a Christian, you're probably just as ignorant as anybody. But as you grow, you learn what God expects you to be and what he wants you to do. Then you start following it by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The pastor is going to be the stupid one if he expects you on the first day that you accept Christ to be as knowledgeable, as good, as behaved as someone who's been in Christ for five years. So it is indeed important for us to know that when God says do not judge, he doesn't mean don't determine what is sinful and what is not sinful. Because if that were the case, he would not have given us the Ten Commandments. He would not have given us 66 books, letters, written to us to help us to do the right thing. So that's not what it means. But what it does mean is God does not want us to judge wrongly. So the question then is, what kind of a judge are you? We all make judgments and we all judge all the time. Do you know why, and I can ask, the lawyer that is in the room here, why the choosing of a Supreme Court judge is viewed as a very important appointment in the history of the United States of America. Why do you think Democrats and Republicans fight all the time on who's going to be the judge? If they all went to school and they all got a law degree, and they all practice law, shouldn't they just judge according to the law? But there is something called biases. Let me ask you another question. I'm asking some important questions while I'm on my way to my point. Why is it in the United States of America? And nobody can deny it. Why is it that we have discriminatory practices in our courts? If justice is blind, that lady that has that thing on, she had that thing on, Because they don't want her to see how beautiful you are or how ugly you are. They don't want her to see how tall you are or how short you are. They don't want her to see what type of clothing you're wearing. They don't want her to see what color you are. That's what justice is supposed to be. But why is it that for the same crime committed... Some people in our society are more jailed than some people. We cannot deny that, can you? So that is why I want to give you four principles That's going to help us to understand this passage. Number one, as a Christian, always use the Bible as your guide. Amen? I'm going to, you know, uh, deal with some things that may be a little bit tougher for you guys to uh, agree with me on it. But just uh, let's open our minds. Christians should not practice cultural morality. Christians should practice 
biblical morality. Because if we judge the way our culture judges, then we are no better than our culture. Are you still with me? It's very common for Christians to judge a person by what society says it's wrong. And I am not in any way proposing that what the society says is wrong is right. But I'm just saying, don't use that standard for your judgment. Amen? Amen. So the next time the pastor tells you, I'm on my way to the casino. Don't condemn him. The next time your Sunday school teacher tells you, I just had a glass of wine with my dinner. Don't condemn your Sunday school teacher. Many times we have allowed the ungodly thinking of our society to affect the way we think and the way we make judgment. There is something also called philosophical ethics. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about biblical ethics. There was a guy named uh, Joseph Fletcher who a long time ago came up with this terminology that is used in ethics today, Christian ethics today. And it is called situation ethics. Where we decide that situation is the thing that determines whether this is right or wrong. And it's a deep theological and philosophical uh, discussion. And there is nothing you can take away from that. But all I'm saying is, when it comes to the ultimate judging of people or situations, we should always let the Bible be the final guide. So Joseph Fletcher said, somebody walked into your room, had two barrel guns, and asked you, do you have any children in your house? And you have three children. And he said, If you have any children, I want you to bring them out because I'm going to shoot them and kill them. So Joseph Fletcher said, what will your answer be? Are you going to lie? Or are you going to tell the truth? So So you see, Joseph Fletcher said, Okay, that is why I believe in situation ethics. You are an idiot if you tell them I have three children. Let's leave that alone. (laughs) But I'm saying to you that really when it comes to it, the most important thing is the Bible and what God says. Because the way we look at life, somebody asked me a question today in Sunday school. I can't remember who. But my answer was, remember what God says, my ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. For as far as the heaven is from the earth, so are my ways from your ways and my thoughts from your thoughts. Do I really trust God Enough that in any situation, 
I am going to do what he says is right. No matter what the situation is. Hallelujah. You got a little bit of situation ethics. So that is the first thing. Don't let your society guide you. And don't judge somebody because the society says this. You got into a fellow member of the church's car and immediately you got in, you saw all these little forms and scratched off quick picks or whatever they call those. And immediately you're making a judgment. I know I do. But it's because you have been conditioned by your society to think one way. The same society that doesn't like the Bible. So you have to be careful. Not cultural morality, but biblical morality. Number two. I'm just giving you ideas to help us in our understanding of this passage. Always let your motive for judgment be correction or restoration. Always let your motive for judging anybody be correction and restoration. If you belong to God and you want to demonstrate the same character that God has, the Bible said, but God demonstrated his love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave It's one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't say whosoever. For whosoever believeth in him. That means God doesn't care where you're coming from. He doesn't care what you have done. He doesn't care what the world says about you. He says if you come to him he will in no wise cast you out. If you come to him, if you make up your mind, you're going to come to him. He's already waiting to receive you. You Remember the prodigal son? When he was miles away and his father could see him, he was ready to receive him. There's absolutely nothing you have done. Absolutely nothing you have done that shocks God. Some of us behave like God is dumb. Oh, he can forgive me. He doesn't know what I've done. He knows everything you've done. He knows what you've done that you didn't even know you did it. That's why you need to come to him just as you are. Because he knows you. There's nothing about you that's hidden from him. And he's willing to accept you. He's willing. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you believe in him, you are saved. If you don't believe, you stand condemned. So because God reacted to us that way, because God dealt with us that way, because God did not come to us, you know, that's why sometimes I'm always perplexed when I ask people to come to church and they tell me, uh, I'll come when I'm ready. You'll never be ready. What do you mean by ready? When I throw away all these sins I'm involved in? That's what God wants to save you from. Why you want to wait until you, when you wait and then when you're perfect, that's where you want to come to the church? 
Amen. Immediately you come here, this church becomes imperfect. If you find a perfect church and you join it, it becomes imperfect. So keep looking for the church. Because you will never find a perfect church. Immediately you join it, oops, it becomes imperfect. So what we need to do is begin to record. This is really important for us as a church. We should not in the church be holding something against somebody else who is part of our body. Shouldn't be. The Bible doesn't say don't correct. Don't lead. Don't guide. No. Then there will be chaos. That's why Matthew chapter 18 is given to us. If a brother sins against you, what do you do? Go to him. Amen? What kind of a pastor do will you think I am? If Frida and I are having a problem at home and I came to you. I, I don't want you to let Frida know I told you this. That's ridiculous. The church is like a marriage. And marriages are difficult. They're also wonderful and marvelous. Amen? And you can do a lot of things with joy and appreciation. Amen? Amen. Those of you that are married are the only ones who should know what I'm talking about. Okay, if you're not married and you know some of the things I'm talking about, you're doing wrong. Okay, well, let's leave it like that. Always let your motive be correction and restoration. In fact, Peter said, at the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, they will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And if you're not disciplined, then you are a bastard. Because God disciplines whom he loves. That's always God's priority to restore us back to him. Number four and number three. Always deal with yourself before you deal with others. Amen? God God is really funny because if you look at the passage, Uh, This will make real good comedy night. Okay? Uh, Do you know what a log is? I I used to pastor in Canada. And the British Columbia, Boston Bar, where I pastored, was a logging city. That's all the job. Sawmills everywhere. That's all the job they have there. And I would go with some members to the sawmill and see how they cut all this Wood, log, they brought from the farm. Okay? They are big. So what God is saying is, here you go. I can't find a log, but. (laughs) It's in your eye. I see that tiny thing in yours. Get rid of this. Okay? Deal with yourself first and then you'll be able to see, oh, Lord, look. It's clear. (laughs) 
you have to understand God, God wants you to deal with yourself first. As the message of the Bible, deal with yourself. And if you are able to deal with yourself, then you are prepared to deal with other people. You have too much mess to deal with somebody else. We'll give you time. Do you know that every time I get on an airplane, especially if I'm traveling to Africa, they will make this announcement. Before we say, just in case we fall in the water. (laughs) They do this before you start leaving. (laughs) Just in case this happens. You know one thing they tell you that really strikes me? If the air pressure changes, grab the mask that falls down from the ceiling, put it on you before you try to help other people. Do you know why? You can't help somebody else if you can't breathe. They say, even if your child is right beside you, don't use that impulse, mother's impulse, father's impulse to say, let me help my child. No, help yourself first before you put that mask on somebody else. We Christians should be the same way. Don't try to help somebody when you still have Boku problem in your life. I'll let Hope translate that for you. <clears throat> It's really important. Always deal with yourself first. That's the message Jesus has given to us. The last point that I want to use to help us understand this. Sometimes it is okay to watch and listen. A cardinal sin is to make a judgment based on what somebody else told you. And I don't think too many of us are exempt from this. We're all imperfect. And do you know what happens when an imperfect person listens to another imperfect person's opinion? To judge somebody that is imperfect. Triple mess. And sometimes you can't get over it. It's like milk, right? Oh, let me put it back in the cup. No, you can't do that. It's all gone. That's why you need to be very sure. Amen? In fact, it it is important. Don't listen to somebody else to make judgment about somebody else. Hello, village. It's a triple whammy. You have a log in your eye? Susan has a log in her eye? Are you talking about the speck in Aaron's eye? terrible. We have to make sure we don't. Let me do this real quick and then I'll shut up. What are the types of judgment God doesn't want us to have? One is superficial. I already expressed that. The second one is hypocritical. We've already said, talked about that. When the When we point out the sin of others while ourselves commit the same sin. Look at Romans chapter 2. Those of you that still have your Bibles. Romans chapter 2. It's very important, it's, it's very easy to remember this passage because all you have to do is remember is Romans 2. 
Okay? Let me read verses 1 through 4. Actually, maybe 1 through 6. Listen. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Please, please don't do that. If God is still working on you, let him finish his work before you open your mouth. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So, when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward what? Repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. It's your attitude. If you're struggling with with the same thing, don't try and correct somebody else that's struggling with the same thing. And don't gossip. Because sometimes, well, maybe not sometimes, almost all the time, gossipers are destroyers. Gossipers are destroyers. And usually when you gossip, you are not redemptive in your attitude. Should I repeat that? If you are gossiping, it's not because you want to redeem somebody. It's because you want to destroy them. Even if what you're saying is true. And God also said that harsh and unforgiving judgment is wrong. Because we're supposed to be gentle toward everyone. Let them say you're a pushover. I'm a pushover for Christ. That's fine. In fact, Jesus said in this great sermon that he preached in the beginning of it, chapter 5, he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall do what? Obtain mercy. They will obtain mercy. And again, in this passage, chapter 7 of uh, Romans, I mean, Matthew, in verse 2, he said, the same way you judge others, you will be judged. I did not write that. And self-righteous judgment is wrong. Self-righteous. James said, God opposes the proud. Amen. You remember Luke chapter 18? Real quick, I think I have about a few minutes. I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. Luke chapter 18. And I start with verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, 
I thank you that I am not like the other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I pay my tithes. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is Jesus' judgment, verse 14. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Lastly, there's just some judgment that is just not true. And that is when you want to slander somebody. You want to be a false witness. And, and you know you know what you're doing. You don't need a sophisticated sermon to tell you what you were doing. You knew exactly. In Proverbs chapter 6, it tells us there are some things God hates. Six of them. And seven that he abhors. It's just, just a way of putting them all together. One of them is one who bear false witness. Who bear false witness. And sometimes bearing false witness is trying to divide people and trying to uh, uh, do cause all this damage. So what are we saying? Believers are warned, we are warned, we are to do the right judgment, we are to judge, but we are to do the right judgment, and the way we can do the right judgment is to make sure we're following the word of God and the will of God. And how can we do that? We are to speak the truth in love. Amen? We are to speak the truth in love. I don't know about you, but I won't tell you something. I won't tell you what it is. But my wife changed my life in Marine City in a class that I was teaching. And she was my student, one of my students. And she said something to me in that class that changed my life up till today. And it was negative. But it was true. And I took care of it right away. And I can tell you, I don't know how long it's been now, probably 34, 34 years. I have never been the same. Some, sometimes people who don't tell you when you're wrong don't love you. But when you love somebody, you tell them so that their lives can be better and they can be reconciled to God. Amen? Let us pray.